along, and Jenny and myself will be monitoring that. Um, joining us today is Jenny Magira, the Digital Learning Coordinator for the Academy of Urban School Leadership, a network of 29 neighborhood Chicago public schools. Previously, Jenny was a fourth and fifth grade math teacher and math technology coach in Chicago public schools, and her education includes a BA in psychology and history from Columbia, as well as an MST in mathematics education from the University of Chica uh, Illinois, Chicago. Her accolades include Apple Distinguished Educator, Google Certified Teacher, and Chicago Public Schools 2012 Tech Innovator of the Year. She's also uh, recently become a, a blogger for Ed Week, um, and her, the title of her blog is Teaching Toward Tomorrow, so check that out. Um, always an honor to have Jenny, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Doug. So hello, everyone. Hope you're having a nice summer. Um, I know that some people are getting back to school, so um, welcome back to school. But for the rest of us, we have a few more weeks before school begins. Hope you're enjoying sun and the fun, or fun in the sun, rather. Um, today we're going to be talking about, as you return to your classrooms, um, what, how to deal with uh, new technology. And some of you probably already had technology in the past year or have been using tech for a while, but might want to rethink how you're uh, preparing for your new year uh, with all of your devices to best support your students. So uh, the first thing I'd like to do to try and make this as interactive as possible is for you to go to this web page. It's bit.ly slash McGraw Hill New Tech, or I'm sorry, McGraw New Tech. bit.ly slash McGraw New Tech. And that is case sensitive. So make sure that you have all lowercase bit.ly slash McGraw New Tech. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat, too. bit.ly slash McGraw New Tech. So go ahead to that web page and fill in that quick Google form. What that's going to do then is sh send you a um, starting off strong plan that I've created for all of you. Um, it's going to give you your own personal version of it that you can use both to follow along with this webinar, but also to use as you're beginning your new school year. So again, that's bit.ly slash McGraw New Tech. And I put that in the chat. I'll do it again one more time, just in case. Um, so you can look in the chat and find it there. Um, go ahead and fill that out. So I'll just give you a moment. For those of you who just joined us, we're going to this web page and filling out um, that quick form, and that's going to send you um, a starting off strong plan um, kind of uh, action plan sheet that you can use to guide you as both as you listen to this webinar, but also um, moving forward with your classroom technology. All right, so that should have taken you to this Google form. You can see it's just a few quick questions. Um, I do ask for your email address, but I promise I'm not going to spam you or sign you up for any weird listservs. It's just to send you uh, this document. Don't worry, you won't get left behind. Um, there's nothing in this webinar that you absolutely have to have it in front of you. It, it just helps. All right, so um, this is kind of a, a doc that you can type in the boxes and follow along as we chat, um, but hopefully uh, you, you find it useful in an ongoing basis. So the first tip that I have for you is that it's okay to feel nervous. Um, as you're beginning with new technology in your classroom or as you're returning to your classroom and you already have technology, it's absolutely necessary uh, to feel nervous. If you're not feeling a little bit nervous, then you're not really um, taking it seriously enough, I often say. Um, it's a lot to have new technology in your classroom. You're taking really powerful tools and putting them in front of both yourself and your students. With great power comes great responsibility. So um, having those fears out there and being honest about it is really important. Important. Sometimes uh, we as teachers are afraid to be afraid in front of our kids or even in front of ourselves. We feel like we have to be the uh, smartest person in the room. Um, and yet we know that a lot of our kids are going to know more about technology than we do when we bring these devices into our classroom. Or even if they don't, that we might fail at some point. And that's totally okay. In 2010, I was a first-year one-to-one teacher, and I was terrified. But I was also terrified to let anyone know that I was terrified. I was too proud to tell anyone that I needed help 
or that I was scared. And so I spent the first three months um, not doing so well, struggling, trying to find what I was doing, and not, not being super successful. And after three months, I finally realized that I needed to ask for help. I needed to, uh, to embrace the fact that I was nervous and scared. And when I finally did that, I realized that I had all of these contacts out there who could help me. And even if they didn't know a lot about technology, they were willing to be a sounding board um, to help me think about the way that I was using it. It also helped me be more honest with my students. Um, when I'm, often when teachers are scared, or at least when I was scared, when something went wrong in the classroom, I'd get really frustrated with my kids because I was afraid they'd find out that I was a failure. When I embraced the fact that I was a little bit nervous, um, I was able to say to them, hey, we're all learning together. We're, we might make mistakes together. We might fa fall down together. But we're going to be able to get up together and learn from that. And iterating and learning from failure is an incredible lesson to teach our kids. So being honest about that with myself helped me go into the classroom with a little bit more of a thick skin. So what I'd like for you to do, for those of you who have received your Starting Off Strong plan, and if you have it, you can just jot it on another sheet of paper or just keep it in mind um, if you don't want to write it down anywhere, is to write down what your concerns are. Whether you have technology in your classroom already or you're about to get technology, what are the things that make you nervous as you think about bringing technology into the classroom? Are you afraid about what your students are going to do? Are you afraid that you're not going to know how to take full use of it? Are you afraid that um, it's going to be a distraction? A lot of teachers are afraid that the technology is going to detract, detract from their learning. What makes you nervous? Um, some teachers are just afraid that the devices won't actually work when it comes time to teach the lesson. It'll work great in planning, and they'll get there, and the Wi-Fi will be out, or batteries will be dead. So go ahead and be honest about your concerns. Get them all down, and that way you can ask for help around them. The next thing that's important to do is to set goals. You want to make sure that you're being thoughtful about what you want to do with the technology. Now, more than that, you want to know what goals you have overall. Remember, we don't want to we don't want to put the technology before the pedagogical horse. We want to remember that all these tech tools are all leading back to the one main goal, which is teaching and learning. We want to make sure that we're supporting our kids. So as you set goals, make sure that the goals aren't about the technology itself, not I want to get better at iPads or I want to learn how to use screencasts. The goals should be more like I want to figure out how to differentiate my math block. Or I want to figure out how to set more meaningful homework for my kids. Or I want to find a way for students to collaborate in real time with one another. Or to make my, um, my, my um, science labs more engaging in the time that I have. So go ahead and write down um, a few goals. Um, make sure that when you're writing your goals, you only keep them to maybe one, two, max three. When you have 10 or 15 goals, then that gets to be overwhelming, and you end up doing none of them. When you only set one goal, or maybe two, then you're more likely to actually dig into them. So think about those goals, and remember, think about the pedagogy and the teaching and learning, not the technology. What do you want to do better this year as a teacher, not a technology-wielding teacher? The technology we can figure out later. Tracy, I see that um, it says that the email says you need permission. Um, make sure you're logging into the doc with the same email that you put into the um, to the form that you filled out. That's the one that it would have been sent to. If you're logged into multiple email addresses, log out of both of them and then log back into another one. Sometimes people are logged into multiple Gmail accounts or their Gmail and their work. Um, James, if you filled out the doc, it should be coming soon. Um, uh, if it's asking for your email and password, Mary, it's probably your Google Drive, Gmail. If you don't have Gmail, then you'll be able to see, um, just see it and not be able to type in it. And um, Sharon, you should be able to hear both my voice and see my screen. Um, so if you can't, uh, let us know, and maybe Doug can help out with that. All right, so I'm going to keep checking those questions ongoing. I'm heading back over to the... And if anyone in the chat can just let me know if you did receive it, that would be great. Um, Cynthia says that um, it's not coming through your school email. Just go ahead and fill out that form again, and it'll resend. It's an automated thing, so I'm not doing it. I set up a Google script that's doing it for me. Okay, so let's move on. So the next tip is to start small. A lot of times people say, oh, I want to use 
the iPads every single day to differentiate everything in my classroom. And that's usually not how it works. Just like you start with training wheels before you start riding a two-wheeler by yourself, um, it's okay to scaffold your technology um, use on your, um, on your own. So you might say, you know what, I just want to use like Google Forms like you just saw me doing for exit tickets to get quick feedback. Um, it might be, I just want to start using video to teach. And it might not seem super transformative. For those of you who have gone to technology conferences and seen people who are quote unquote experts, or people who have been doing it for longer, do these things that seem downright magical and say, oh, I want to do that tomorrow. Understand that that was a journey. They didn't do that the very next day. They started small. They probably started with one or two small ideas and did that not just for a day or two, but for weeks, sometimes an entire quarter or semester. Got really good at it and then slowly scaffolded on, just like you do with your kids. So don't try and load your plate too much. Think of it like um, as a marathon, not a sprint. You want to take your time, get good at something, and then move on from there. A lot of times when teachers get frustrated and burn out fast or quickly uh, with technology, it's because they try to take on too much a little too fast. Um, so as you're setting those goals, start small. If the goal is a really large goal, then um, pull up one goal at a time rather than trying to take um, many at once or chunk the goal into smaller pieces. So in the next part, go ahead and start small. Think of the one focus that you're going to dig into. So of the goals, take one of those goals and break off a chunk of it. Break off a, a piece of that Kit Kat bar, if you will, and think, what small piece of one of those goals will you start in first, in first quarter? All right. The next thing I want to make sure that everyone knows and has in mind, and I know that many of you know and realize this, but I just think it is important to say, is that technology is not classroom management. A lot of folks think that when they get devices into their classroom, it's going to be the magic, um, the magic engagement tool, saying, oh, now that I have iPads, now that I have Chromebooks, now that I have Kindles or Android tablets, they're so engaging because they're technology, so my students are just going to behave because they're excited about technology. And inevitably, you're going to find out that um, that's not the case, that you know, once you have the technology, you know, they can still do naughty things on, on technology, just like they would with any other tool in the classroom. And so with that in mind, I want to remind everyone that taking technology away for students doing bad things is not a punishment, or should I say, it's not the best punishment. What then? Ha what happens? Um, I was actually the queen of taking technology away from my kids. Um, I thought it was a great thing that I could lord over them and use as an incentive or a negative consequence, right? So uh, when my students were caught on the wrong website or the wrong app, or when they did something bad that had nothing to do with the iPad, I would, you know, be that fascist dictator and say, "Oh, ha ha! Now you lose the iPad," and I would take the iPad away from them, and you know, oftentimes even, you know, basically publicly shame them, which is as we all know as teachers, really the wrong thing to be doing. Um, but what that taught my students was that the iPad was a treat or a reward. And so the, the lesson they were taking home was, oh, iPads are these extra add-ons. They're for kids who are good, like recess or stickers or candy. What they weren't getting out of it, what I wanted them to get out of it, is that the iPads or the technology was a pedagogical tool. It was a learning tool that was central to the way that we were teaching and learning in our classroom. So instead of saying, OK, the iPad's here for me to learn, they were thinking the iPad is a toy. So I was reinforcing the exact opposite of what I was hoping to teach my students by taking it away and using it as a punishment or a reward. Instead, think about the exact same uh, use um, cases that we have when students make poor choices with other things, like a pencil or a textbook. One of my friends, Ben Kovac, says, we don't have acceptable use policies for pencils. So why is it that the iPad's supposed to be a technological tool, I'm sorry, a, a pedagogical tool, and we have to have AUPs for that? If our student throws a pencil across the room or writes a naughty word inside of a textbook or inside of the bathroom, do we respond by saying, OK, kids, you lose the privilege to have pencils, or you, you, you lose the privilege to use that math textbook, or go to the bathroom for the rest of the year? No, that would be ludicrous. So let's use the same best practice that we use with the other tools in our classroom that we also use um, uh, with the de technological devices as well. 
So as we're thinking about how we're passing out these powerful tools to our students and knowing that we're not going to take them away if they do something naughty, but instead use the same, um, the same instructional consequences that we might with anything else, we want to make sure we have a management system. We want to make sure we're smart about how our students are uh, using the technology. One thing that I've done in the past is um, use the wallpaper on my iPads to set up um, the way that we pass them out and the way that students share them. So here's an example from my blog of the iPad wallpaper. So you can see here that um, I've put on each iPad a number for which, um, which iPad they have. For my primary students, instead of having numbers, they take a picture of themselves holding a piece of paper with a number. So a first day of school activity is all the primary students have a sheet of paper with a big number that the teacher has written, and then they decorate that number. They might color it in, they might um, add some designs to it, they might draw in the numbers, they might um, draw um, that quantity of different things. So it's also teaching counting, so the kindergarten or first grade kids might draw 11 stars and then 11 apples and 11 unicorns. Um, and then they hold that piece of paper, that analog sheet of paper that they draw on with crayons, and then the teacher takes a picture of them holding that piece of paper. And that picture of them holding the paper becomes the wallpaper of their iPad. In that way, they're able to have ownership of it. They can see themselves. Um, and they are able to um, see quickly which iPad is theirs. This works with Chromebooks, laptops, netbooks, anything, because all of these do have wallpapers. Something else that we do is you can see we color code the different cases. So the iPads or Chromebooks or laptops, they stay out all day. We don't put them back in the cart. We buy devices that purposefully have long battery life so they can stay out of the cart all day. Normally when you put the devices back in the cart, um, then you're, it's hard to um, it's hard to take them out. It becomes a transition time. So then you're saying, oh, well, I don't really want to take these devices out because it's going to take five, ten minutes to take them out of the cart, so let's just skip that activity. If they're out in the middle of the table, just like their pencil caddy or their crayons or scissors or anything else that are out all day, um, then you're more likely to use them more often. Having them color-coded makes it easy for the kids to quickly grab their own device and use it without saying which one is mine, which one is yours. For those of you who are using laptops and Chromebooks and netbooks where you don't necessarily have cases like this, go to your local Walmart or Target, get contact paper or shelf liner paper in different colors, usually five or six different colors, however many kids sit in a pod or a desk set um, that you have or a table, and then cut them into shapes, so triangles, circles, squares, um, you know, di whatever different shapes that you have, octagons, hexagons, and then write the numbers on them. And then I have, you know, the green, I have the triangles, I have the circles, I have the squares, and I'm able to differentiate my kids in lots of different ways. So one student might have on the back of their Chromebook a green triangle with the number one in it. So that student might stand up if I say, all right, triangles line up. So all the triangles, whether they're pink triangles, green triangles, orange triangles, yellow triangles, they all line up. If I say, all right, um, anyone, all the students who are using green, you're going to be working on this collaborative project. So they might be all reading a book together or working on a project together. I might say all odd numbers team up with an even number and discuss in a Socratic seminar why you're thinking about this or not. Uh, graph these inequalities together. So there's a lot of different ways that you can use the physicality of these tech devices to uh, practice old pedagogy like grouping and differentiation, whether you teach pre-K all the way up to graduate school. And, and I have done this with graduate students, by the way. Um, so having a management system is really important. You want to think about how you're having kids uh, get the devices in the morning. Oftentimes having students come up early and, and put all the devices on the tables and having one or two students stay late and put them back in the cart and plug them in is great. If your kids are bringing their own device to school every day, think about adding things to your class list, uh, your supply list at the beginning of the year, like power uh, strips. And then have a juice bar at the back of your room where if kids forget to power up their devices overnight, if they're in a BYOD where they're bringing their own device or they have a take-home device, they can kind of sit in bean bags or something in your library or at a, at a kidney-shaped table and get some power really quickly in the morning so that they don't have a dead device all day. It might not seem like a huge, um, you know, genius fix, but just by putting 
you know, a couple power strips on your um, on your teacher wish list or your um, parent supply list at the beginning of the year, and then having those around your classrooms can really save the day if your kids are constantly bringing in dead devices. And I know that happens for a lot of uh, classroom teachers out there. So think about your rollout plan. What are some ideas that you want to think about setting up at the beginning of the year, routines that you want to establish in the fall? Um, these are things that you want to script out in your lesson plan. You want to take time to practice them, um, just like you would have, you know, my, my elementary teachers might practice things like literature circles or math groups. My high school teachers might practice Socratic seminar or having kids do gallery walks or publications or the way that they turn in homework. So these are things that are pedagogical moves that you need to think about that are going to be new to your classroom ecosystem and environment, but you want to still plan out thoughtfully and allow time at the beginning of the year to practice and set up. So the next thing that um, I'd like for you to start thinking about is learning management systems. Now when you start going digital in your classroom and you start having your students do more with technology, they're going to start creating more um, digital content. And the hard thing about that is when you have paper and pencil, it's a little bit easier to visualize how you're going to get things from kids, grade it, and give them feedback. But when you have digital content, how are you going to get it from kids? You don't want to get a million emails a day. You don't want kids emailing you their assignments each day. You're going to have to click on you know, 30 to over 100 emails every day, download the file, open it up on your computer, give feedback somehow, attach it to an email, and send it back another 30 to 100 emails to give feedback. At that point, you're going to be thinking, I should have just done this on notebook paper. However, having things like a learning management system, otherwise known as an LMS, creates a workflow system that makes it a lot easier. LMSs are really popular. There are a lot of them. The, um, some older ones are Blackboard. Um, some newer ones are Haiku, Edmodo, and my favorite, which is Schoology. Um, really quickly, I'm just going to show you a quick view of Schoology. Um, it's a really powerful system that um, allows you to basically, it is a learning management system, but what I love about Schoology, it's more about the learning than the management. So it allows you to run a class all, on, um, all through the internet. Obviously, you'd be in person with your kids, but in a way that is truly similar and reflective of the way that you might run a, uh, run a class um, in real life. Um, so obviously, you'd be with your students, you're in person, but this allows you to, um, to keep, uh, keep all of the digital content in one place and make it easier for you to access their work. So here is a demo class that I have. This is uh, my student innovation team. You can see here that I'm able to have a lot of different materials like assignments, tests and quizzes, files, discussions, albums. Uh, these are photo albums and pages are little mini web pages that I can build within um, this, uh, this Schoology learning management system here. Um, updates are messages that I can send to my class and classes that um, and my kids can respond back to it. So I can say, hello, how are you? The kids can have comments about it. I can give them um, surveys. I can do little polls. So I could do a little poll. Oops, that's not a poll. Um, I can do a little poll right here by saying, like, you know, where do you want to go on a field trip? Do you want to go to the field museum or the shed aquarium? It also has badges now, which I love. So I can give students badges for perfect attendance, for being a good listener, for most improved, for participation. For those of you who use Class Dojo, it's kind of like that, but you can base it off of other things. But what I love about this is you can create your own badges. So I can put in my own images here. I can create different shapes and pictures. I can upload my own images. Um, I can make badges like McGarris Mathematicians or um, you know, Super Helper, something like that. I can also take attendance. So for those of you who are high school teachers, this is a really great way to quickly take attendance. I just click here. I can mark them absent, late, excused, or in that, again, um, here. This little bubble lets me say uh, a message, like in bathroom, hanging out, which is why they were late. Um, so I can put that there and mark them late. But what's really nice about this is um, all of this is visible in the parent readout as well. So parents can have access to this learning management system, and they're able to see what I see for their own student. So they can't see the whole class, but they can see their own kid. 
I'm able to see all of my members, and you can have co-teachers. The co-teachers have a little crown next to them. Um, and so we can uh, co-teach a class, and then I have all my beautiful analytics as well about how, when my students are um, logging on, which assignments they've completed, um, how they've participated in discussions, et cetera. Um, back to materials, um, something else that's pretty powerful. Oops, I pop back over here. Um, the discussions feature in Schoology is what I think sets it apart and over things like Edmodo and some of the other learning management systems. It's pretty powerful how um, students are able to add um, video and images um, and that it's a, it's a threaded dialogue. So in other learning management systems, it's one stream, but here you can see there's threaded replies so kids can reply directly to their colleagues. They can like each other's comments as well, but they can also respond to each other with video and an image, which makes it possible for me to have really in-depth discussions with primary students who can't type so well. So um, here is when my students were talking about Schoology or Edmodo, we were talking about moving over, and you can see they're adding uh, pictures and images. So here's one with from Maverick. I agree more because it's better, but I like Edmodo better, and it's interesting of the Edmodo update too. All right, go ahead and put your iPad. So you can hear me teaching in the background, but he's responding to um, Miracle right here um, through video. This is really great for math teachers because oftentimes um, math teachers want students to show their works. So they can either take a screenshot on their iPad or take a picture from their Chromebook and um, of their work and then upload their work along with their discussion here. But another thing that's really nice about this is I can see how my students participate. So I can filter by user. So if I want to see how many times Johnny um, participated, I can see eight times. If I click his name, I can highlight all of his responses here. Another thing that I can do um, in discussions is actually grade their discussion. So if I go to one of my discussions that I um, had set for a grade, and let's see if I can remember one that I made for a grade, maybe this one? Nope. Um, I don't think I graded a ton of these because this was a group that was just more practicing. But if I do have any of these set for a grade, um, then, oh, right here, I have this little button on the side, and I can give the student a grade and be, say, great work, and I can decide whether to show to student, and this shows up in the grade book. Um, so really powerful. But the most important thing about Schoology and any learning management system is the workflow. So I'm able to assign a different assignments um, and give my students um, and give my students uh, either a template to use to turn back in or um, or something else. You can see here I gave them a PDF that I wanted them to annotate and then you can see the students who have turned it in is this demo student right here. I'm able, to, I'm able to see the work that the student has done. This was just a demo so I just scratched it up and if there were multiple students all their faces would be down here and I can just click through them and I can also give feedback by drawing right on their document right here, give them a grade, and then submit it, and that shows up in the grade book. So instead of getting a bunch of emails, I can just click through all the student work in this navigation bar down here at the bottom and give them feedback up here. Let me see if I can find one with multiple students work in it. Um, I believe this fractions worksheet has, um, oops, that's the one I was just looking at, has some more stuff in it. But um, this is a really powerful um, tool that just makes it a little bit easier um, to get um, to get work back from students and to give feedback. And whether or not you decide to use Schoology or something else, it is just important that you have some sort of workflow uh, process because without it, it, it becomes rather difficult to get work to and from students. So I'm not finding any that has a ton of responses since this is a demo class, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, Tracy asks how this, how this uh, compares to Google Classroom. Um, we are going to use this in concurrently with Google Classroom. Google Classroom is not a learning management system. It's a drive management system. It makes Google Docs easier to use with students. So I'm going to use that to share Google Docs with kids, but then Schoology to do all of the learning management. Fatima, Schoology is free. There's an enterprise version that gives you a few um, juiced up uh, resources like tracking item analysis over time with Common Core or um, um, integrating third party um, curricula or uh, gradebook integration where it automatically syncs with your district gradebook and automatically generates student email addresses and names. Um, if you, without, the, everything I've shown you so far is free. I have the free version, but you can get the enterprise version. 
Um, Jody was asking two questions. Is it very expensive? So you heard it's free, so no. And do students need emails to access it? No. My kids don't have email addresses in the younger grades, and you do not need an email address to use it. Um, can students see each other's work, Sarah asks. If you do a discussion or have them post to the school page, yes. Otherwise, no. So you can do either one based on what you want them to do. And Cynthia is asking when may we access Google Classroom. That should be out by the end of August. All right, so hopefully that helped uh, and gave you some ideas about learning management systems. Edmodo is another great one. It's super similar, also free in a similar way. Haiku um, is Canvas. Those are all other learning management systems. Um, but whatever you're thinking about, definitely have a plan of attack. You definitely want something to manage all of that digital content workflow. So for your LMS, I wrote in Schoology there, but you can cross that out and write whatever you want. Just write down some ideas for what you're going to dig into. The next tip I have for you is developing a student leadership team. So it's important to think about how you're going to um, do this on your own. A lot of you, I'm sure, are classroom teachers who are by yourself with 20 to 30 kids every day, or if not more. Um, and we want to think about um, how are you going to unroll these ideas, like Schoology, or apps, or routines with your students. And by leveraging the power of kids and saying, yeah, they might come in knowing more about tech than I do or be more tech savvy. That's great. Let's use that. So let's develop a student leadership team within your classroom who are going to be your student teachers, if you will, and help lead the transformation of your class. What I usually do is have uh, an application, like a job application. I have students who are really interested in technology apply for a job on the student leadership team. Um, in some of our iPad classrooms, we call it a genius bar, just like you'd see at the Apple store. Um, and we, once we develop that uh, student leadership team, they apply for the application or for the job. I do interviews with my kids during lunch or before or after school, and then I hire them, quote unquote. Um, they have some rules as part of the job, which are don't touch, be kind, and go slow. Don't touch means um, not to touch anyone else's device. Uh, the biggest thing about my high-flying te students and teachers, actually, is that when someone's having a hard time, they want to just take the device out of their hand and do it for them. And when you do it for them, they're never going to learn anything. So the important thing is to say, don't touch. Put your hands behind your back and tell them with your words and not with your hands. Talk them through it so they can do it again. The next thing is to be kind. Um, my, my really high-flying students also get super frustrated with kids who don't get it right away. They'll say, oh, what are you, stupid? Or, oh my god, um, why don't you get it? You're so slow. And so I remind them that when they don't get something, oh, excuse me, that when they don't get something, I never call them stupid or um, tell them that they're going so slow. I'm patient with them, and I give them time to figure it out on their own. So I, t I remind my students to be kind with their words and their attitudes. And finally, go slow. From listening to me on this webinar, you can tell that I talk kind of fast, and my kids have gotten used to it, and so now they talk fast too. But I remind them that you know being a Miss McGarrah is actually a bad thing. And they said, you know, sometimes are you frustrated when I'm going so fast in math class? And they say, oh my god, yes. And they said, don't be a McGarrah. And so they remind each other now, and it's actually become kind of an, an ad, uh, adjective. Oh no, you're McGarrying me. Don't do that. Um, Slow down. Um, don't don't be such a Megara. So they they tell each other to go slow, be kind, and don't touch. And it's a job, so you know, just like any other job, if they're not being very nice, then um, they might not get to keep that job. So um, they re they really do like it, and they love they love the power of being able to support each other and the um, the self efficacy that that provides. Uh, when we do a new app or a new routine, I bring my student leadership team in um, a week or two in advance. I meet with them at lunch or before school or after school or when they're finished with something, and I teach them the app. They practice teaching it on each other. They ask me questions. And then when I roll out that app or routine in front of the whole class, I have all these ringers um, seated at every table. So when I say, all right, everyone, press the red button, and normally I'd have 10 kids yelling, I don't see a red button because they're in the wrong app or the wrong page or whatever, I say, you know, find your student leadership team member and they turn to them and they can get support from them. And um, they have someone at their table they can just turn to and get help. Um, really quickly, I see some questions. Um, Barbara asked why I chose Schoology over Edmodo. It just has a lot more features. It's uh, more user-friendly on the iPad and on the um, 
computer. They have a really great Android app. They have a great iPad app. It works great on all browsers. And the features, they're just more features. The discussions are better, the badges, all of that. I've, I've used them both concurrently. I had my kids using them in parallel. And if, you know, if Edmodo ever, um, you know, rocks it in somewhere, we'll definitely think about going back. But right now, Schoology does rock out um, and over my big campus, Cynthia, as well. And um, Tracy asked, would this work in high school with five classes with 32 students? Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you're asking about Schoology or the student leadership team, but both would work. Um, Schoology, obviously, you can create multiple classes. And for student leadership team, we usually have student leadership teams for each class. Um, and so they, uh, they move with their class, or you could just do um, for your specific period. Um, Sarah asked if I change up the leadership team over the year. Yes, every quarter. Um, they have to reapply for their jobs. Other kids can apply as well. Um, and will I be exploring Google Classroom coming out in August? Um, not on this webinar. I don't think we're going to have time, um, but maybe we can consider it in the future. Um, the ratio of student leaders to students, usually one to five or one to six is great. If they, small group, think small group would be good of student leaders to students. Ken was asking that. Um, so I think I got all your questions, but feel free to keep asking any questions that, that come up. So talking about um, getting kids prepared, and we talked about already having um, a having a, um, sorry, uh, you know, power strips on your student supply list at the beginning of the year. Think about headphones as well, especially headphones with microphones. Um, if you've ever heard of Max Cases, they're a really good, um, they're a really great vendor that sells um, really cheap and expensive um, cases for all devices, uh, Chromebooks, iPads, Android devices, um, but also they have this, this is probably like the best and cheapest headphone I've seen that has a built-in um, microphone. And you definitely want to um, have the microphone on the, um, on the headphone if possible. Um, it's the Max headset because, um, you know, as you're doing more with digital literacy and digital creation, your kids are going to be making things and they're going to want to be able to record their voice. And so having this mic is really great. It has a great little volume bar right here. And what I like about it is over, it's over ear, but it also allows for some of our kids have quite large craniums. So um, you can kind of make it and stretch it out. And we've had over the ear headphones that are that don't stretch out so well. So my poor babies by the end of the day all have headaches because it's squeezing their heads all day. But this headset is really comfy. It's really durable. It works well with kids. Um, it's adjustable and this mic is actually really powerful as well. And 1995 is their uh, is their um, their public uh, price, but I do believe if you buy a lot as a district, um, they'll give you a price break. They're really great people and um, it's a pretty it's a pretty good thing to have. Um, other things that you might want to think about is having a stylus, especially for math classes or for young kids if they're writing on um, on iPads or Android devices, they make bigger styli that are more appropriate for primary hands. Um, it, it, more, it better approximates writing. Um, you might also want to think for Chromebooks if you want to have a mouse, an external mouse, because the trackpad can be frustrating. So what other auxiliary um, purchases might you want to make um, by putting it on the supply list and having parents bring that in? Now, I work in a district that's 100%, or not a district, but schools that are basically 100% free and reduced lunch, and so a lot of times, um, putting a fifteen or twenty dollar item on a supply list um, won't won't ever become a reality. They just won't bring them in. In fact, they might be insulted or angry that I put it on there. In which case, fundraising, donors choose, or sometimes even finding the cheapy version of these things, just going to a dollar store, it's it's not a bad idea. And having all of these resources in advance are great. Um, for Jill wrote external keyboards. You do need external keyboards for the iPad for the Park and Smarter Balance Common Core Assessment. Um, I do recommend uh, wired external keyboards and not Bluetooth. Um, if any of you have tried to set up 30 or 40 Bluetooth keyboards, you know that it's a huge headache. Um, they have they sell them, um, and a lot of different vendors sell them. Max Cases has two right here, 8-pin for the um, 
for the newer iPads and 30 pin for the older iPad 2s. Um, again, um, there's a cheaper discount, I think, for this if you buy several. But it's nicer when you can just plug them in, um, just pop these guys right into your iPad, rather than having to worry about Bluetooth setup and then something goes wrong during testing and then all of a sudden, jo you know, Johan's accidentally controlling Susan's iPad by accident, or maybe not by accident, because maybe he hacked it. Um, and also what I like about these, um, uh, these keyboards that were made directly for the iPad is they have all of the iPad buttons built in. So the screensaver, the brightness, the mute, um, all that stuff, the keyboard hiding, all that good stuff uh, is right up there on this top um, navigation as well. So um, definitely want to think about that. There's a lot of great vendors out there um, that you can look at, but you want to make sure that you're thinking about this ahead of time and giving suggestions to families. The difference between um, asking for things like this on a school supply list than like folders or notebooks because you can say bring in you know a, um, a three ring binder and it's pretty hard to get that wrong but saying bring in an external keyboard it's pretty easy to get that wrong because parents don't have as much experience with that so they might not know exactly which one to get or what model or um, what kind of stylus or what kind of headphones um, I've had uh, parents bring in headphones that have the two jack input, some you know, like you would put into your stereo, the red and the white um, input, which doesn't fit in an iPad. So you want to make sure they're getting the right one. Um, and so by having links, uh, that makes it a lot easier for parents. Sometimes sending home a sheet of paper with a QR code that links to a specific uh, brand that you want. So you might want to go ahead and start writing down a wish list here. Put down links to things that you want to buy. Go on Amazon. Find what makes sense. Um, I've seen seen teachers even do Amazon wish lists where they almost like a registry where they write down, you know, I'm trying to get 30 headphones and they have uh, family members, parents, community members, whomever fund that wish list to buy devices or peripherals for their classrooms. Um, you also want to be thinking about what apps or programs that you're um, loading onto these devices. Whether you're using a Chromebook or an iPad, the thing that I really want you to realize is creation apps are always more powerful than content apps. And by that I mean a lot of times teachers, uh, when you're teaching math, you look for fraction apps. When you're teaching reading, you look for grammar apps. When you're looking, teaching science, you look for star or chemistry apps. And um, while that's great, what you want to keep in mind is those apps are only going to stay as relevant for as long as you're teaching that specific content uh, piece. Uh, once you move beyond that unit, um, they might not be so relevant. So you're spending all that money, and you do have to pay for each app. It's not $3.99 for 30 iPads. It's $3.99 times each iPad that you uh, are syncing it to, or Android device, or Chromebook. And so you don't want to be spending all this money on something you're only going to use for a week. And moreover, it's pretty low level usually when it is a content app. Creation apps, on the other hand, like movie making apps, mind mapping apps, screencasting apps, puppet apps, um, augmented reality, QR scanners, all those things, they can be used in a variety of content areas for a variety of grade levels all year long. So I have some favorite apps that I like to use. Oh, I have my um, website open right here. Um, and on my website, which I've, I'll share with you again at the end, um, here are 12 of my favorite creation apps. Um, I count Schoology as a creation app just because of the discussion piece and the able, that they're able to create photo albums and things on it. Um, a lot of these are free. The only ones that cost are um, Explain Everything, uh, Book Creator. I think those two, yep, are the only two that cost money. Um, but the rest of them are all free. For Android apps, here are some of my favorite Android apps. Um, Book Creator also explain everything. Also Schoology, also WeVideo, and Simple Mind for mind mapping. Um, for the Chromebook, there's a lot of great Chrome apps, but you have the entire Google Drive suite that's also free. Um, if you want to check out in, um, apps on a Chromebook, you have to go to the Chrome Web Store, which is chrome.google.com slash web store. So it's chrome.google.com slash web store. And you can find a lot of great apps here if you click on education. You can find a ton of great education apps, and again, most of these are free. Some of them have subscriptions, but you'll find that most of them are free. Definitely great to check these out. Um, some of them off the top of my head. Lucidchart is pretty fabulous. Um, so is um, so there's a lot of like puppet type apps that you can try out. Um, 
that are that are pretty great as well. So you might want to start taking a list of different creation apps that are powerful, that are going to sustain your kids all year, give them a voice, allow them to show what they know, and are going to kind of push your pedagogy. Um, I recommend that you always start with three. If you start the year with too many apps, then you could turn into app overload. Um, it becomes like trying to learn like six different languages at the same time. You get confused. You never get good at any of them. If you um, slow down and stick with you know one, two, maybe three apps at a time most, then um, you can really get good at each app and really have your kids master them. You see them troubleshooting and thinking of different ways to dig deep um, and uh, play into them. Um, oh, Wes was here. Bye, Wes. Wes uh, is a friend. He's headed out. So thanks for joining us. Fatima says she's a high school Spanish teacher. Oh, yeah, you want students to record their conversation. Fatima, can you write in uh, what devices you have, and then I can respond more specifically? Um, let's see here. And Carolina is asking about creating online quizzes. Uh, Schoology actually allows you to create create great online quizzes that like can embed video, it can embed, um, it can embed images, fill in the blank, um, open response. So I would definitely recommend Schoology for uh, online assessments. And Cynthia, um, you said you aren't able to get uh, access to the materials. I wonder if you mean this specific document. Um, I would just recommend trying to fill out the form again. I'm sorry if that didn't work out for you. Maybe try a different email address. Um, Ruth has laptops, MacBooks. MacBooks are incredibly powerful. Um, the entire iLife suite is free on those, so iMovie, uh, I believe, uh, I think they're free actually, I, I might be wrong, but if not, you want to check out iMovie, um, iPhoto, GarageBand, those are really powerful creation apps that kids can use, um, along with the entire Google Drive suite, which works great on a Chrome browser on a MacBook. I'm on a MacBook right now. So the last thing I want you to think about is your first day. Um, whether it's the first, very first day of school or the first time that you're pulling out the devices a couple weeks into school, you want to really think about how you're introducing these in a positive way. You want kids to see this as an adventure. You want them to feel like they're partners with you in using these devices for good and not evil, for learning and exploration, and you want to make them feel empowered. So you want to script that out and have a plan, lesson plan out how you're going to share with your students um, exploring using these devices and digging into them. Um, so make sure that you're being thoughtful about it and you're taking all of this into account. The final thing I want to tell you is as you're going to conferences and as you're learning more about technology, don't trust presenters. Um, we're all full of hot air. We talk to you about all the great things that we do, but you know what oftentimes presenters don't do is tell you all of the mistakes they had along the way, and I kind of told you that before. Remember that anytime you're seeing something amazing or you're seeing a neighbor or a colleague rock out with devices, know that they had some stumbling blocks along the way, that they fell and skinned their knee, and that what they're sharing with you is the outcome of iteration, perseverance, and trying. The difference between the people who are sharing out and doing all this magical um, tech stuff isn't that they're better at technology than anyone else. It's not that they're smarter or better teachers. It's that they persevered for longer. It's that when they fell down, they got back up, and when they failed, what they did after they failed was brush themselves off, get up, and try again. So be those people who are knowing going into this that yes there's going to be some days where bad things happen there was one time that I accidentally synced hot tub time machine to all 60 of my fourth graders iPads and then I had to un delete them during first period as kids were finding it and trying to stop them from watching that terrible movie which I don't even like I don't know how it happened um, actually, I do like it, full disclosure. But um, the problem is, is I didn't want it to be on my fourth grader's iPads. I didn't know what I was doing, so I had to get it quick before I got fired. So things are going to happen, but I didn't give up. I deleted it quickly. I moved on. I was honest with my students. I said, you know, I rented some movies over the weekend. It accidentally synced. I'm going to collect all your iPads and delete it. Miss McGarra made a mistake. Let's try that again. And because I was honest, my kids were a lot more forgiving with me, and I lived to tell another tale, and now it's really rocking out, and I'm able to support other teachers. So with your starting off strong plan, um, hopefully that's helped you. I'm going to answer some questions now. Here's my uh, website. On my website, I have my email address. There's my Twitter handle. Um, thanks, you guys, for tuning in. Um, I see here uh, that, okay, uh, Troy is looking to improve technology with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Access. Um, 
you know, those are those are great tools. I would highly recommend checking out Google Drive, um, the Google Drive suite. It's really powerful. A lot of big organizations are moving away from Microsoft Office and towards Google Apps for Education. They offer a lot more um, capability for collaborative um, for collaboration. So I would definitely check it out, Troy. It's free. There's a ton of great resources at Google.com/education. Um, Cynthia. Um, Cynthia's finally got it, but she's asking. Has said you have to ask permission. I would try logging out, Cynthia, and log back in under each email address. It's probably sending to you, but you're logged into the wrong email address. And Fatima says you have laptops. Um, I would say that um, for recording your kids' voice, try MoveNote, M-O-V-E-N-O-T-E, MoveNote.com. It's a great thing that you can um, have video up, you can record yourself, or you can have slides where they're reading different discourse. They can read different Spanish passages and also record their voices. It's free, it's really easy to use, and they have it for educators, so MoveNotes. Um, Nikita, does Schoology have simple test questions? Um, the, the, I believe the enterprise version does. The uh, free version, I think, um, you kind of have to make your own, but you can share quizzes with other teachers. So you have, if you have three teachers creating quizzes, you can share amongst each other. Um, yep, Tracy, fail first attempt at learning. Um, uh, that's a great acronym. Tracy was sharing a great acronym that um, I've heard a lot of people use, like Ken Shelton and a lot of great educators out there, F-A-I-L, first attempt in learning. So failing is not the end, it's actually the beginning. Thanks, Tracy, for sharing that, that piece. Um, for exit slips, electronically I've used, uh, Barbara's asking what devices or tools rather I use for exit slips, I've used Google Forms and Schoology. I like Google Forms for quick formative assessments to get a quick uh, read or litmus test on how the kids are doing, but I like Schoology for more ongoing assessments where I want to record grades over time because they save it to a grade book that aggregates um, and I can wait. Thanks, Donna, for tuning in. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Fatima and Tracy. You're just saying thank you. So um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to dump them in. I think we just have about three minutes left. But otherwise, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, hope you have a great rest of your summer, and I hope to see you on the next webinar next week. Doug? Thanks, Jenny, so much for, for presenting. Uh, we do have one last question. Um, actually, um, Kay sent in a question uh, prior to the webinar, emailed to us. And she was looking for a standard agreement of use um, document suitable for junior high, sc uh, high school students. So uh, maybe some help there in uh, how to construct that document or how to get started, if you don't mind. Yeah, so acceptable use policies are a lot of things that school districts have to think about. Um, you know, I made a joke about, you know, why would we do an acceptable use policy for a, for a technology when we don't do it for pencils? But in all, you know, to be completely honest, districts want us to, so we should. Um, you know, think about... Think of, you know, there's a lot that online you can find templates. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to share the one that I have for my network. But um, what you can, you know, there are some templates online that you can find. But also sitting down with your administration and thinking about what expectations you want students to have and having both parents, teachers, and parents, or I'm sorry, parents, students, and teachers all sign a contract can be helpful. I've also seen students help build acceptable use policies, which I think is really powerful. Having them engage in crafting the language and expectations expectations, gives them more buy-in and ownership, and helps them stay true to it for longer. Thank you so much, Jenny. That's very helpful. Um, <clears throat> for everyone that attended today, we're going to send a link to the uh, Word document version of the um, Starting Off Strong plan that Jenny was referencing. I chatted out the link to that just a little bit ago, but I'm going to include that in the, the follow-up email for everyone as well. Um, as you guys exit the webinar, we've got a survey. If you don't mind to fill out on the way out of the webinar, it would be great. Um, just to let us know how we're doing and how we can uh, help improve and plan our future webinars. Um, if you have any other questions, I think we got to just about everything today. Um, if you have any other questions after the webinar, feel free to contact Jenny directly as she shared her info. Or contact us uh, at webinars at mheducation.com and we'll be more than happy to help you how we can or forward John to Jenny. Um, we really appreciate everybody taking time to join us today, and Jenny, obviously, we really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, we, we uh, look forward to a great school year with everybody. And uh, uh, for those of you that are already back, um, congratulations and good luck. We're here to help. And um, for those of you who are still in summer, 
Um, enjoy it until you get back to school, and we look forward to partnering with you. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.